everyone. We know that we are within a new year, a new start, and a new beginning. And it's a blessing to live to see another year. And as we know, the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, let us give thanks to his holy and matchless infinite name. The Bible says, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that's within me, blessed is holy name. The psalmist says that let everything that have breath praise the Lord. My name is Quain Ferron, a second year religion and theology major, which is from from the parish of St. Thomas. I am one who loves the word Quain Ferron. Yeah, he is from the parish of St. Thomas. I am one that loves the word of God. I love knowledge and I love truth. My message this morning is titled 2020 Vision Redirection. So that's 2020 Vision Redirection. So if you can, just take your Bibles in hand. And I want you to go with me through to the book of John. Looking at John 5 verses 1 through to 9. 2020 Vision Redirection. John 5 verses verses 1 through to 9. And say amen when you are there. That's John 1 verses, John 5 verse 1 through to 9. And you just follow in your Bible as I read. I'll be reading from the King James Version. And it reads, John 5, verses 1 through to 9. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, of blind, of halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. Whether the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another step down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Let us pray. Divine, eternal Father, use me now to speak your word. I am just your tool and I am just your instrument. Take now my tongue, Lord, my lips, and write every word upon it, so that as I speak it, it is your words that go forth with power and with clarity. Move upon our hearts now, Father, and let there be a change and a transformation, and let the name of Jesus be glorified. For this I am be pray and I will ask in Jesus' name. 2020 vision redirection we know of the saying that says without vision the people perish without vision we can fulfill our mission so our eyes must be open and our minds must be active and attentive and we must learn apply as we read the word of God this was after the woman at the well encounter after the healing the healing rather of the noble man son at Capernaum the Bible would have us know that after this there was a feast of the Jews 
and Jesus went up to Jerusalem being a Jew wasn't excluded from this feast. Some scholars believe that this feast was a feast of Pentecost and some believe that it was a Passover. The book of John didn't state which feast it was but it tells us that there was a feast and the Jews went to that feast at Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. Now as you look on this verse that there was a sheep market and there was a pool but you may think that perhaps this was a place where somehow sinners could purchase sheep in order to offer for sacrifice for their sins. But when you dig deep within the scripture you will realize that it is not so. There is nowhere in scripture where you will find that there was a sheep market. In the time of Jesus the, the offerings of lamb was purchased inside the temple. But there is scripture evidence within the Bible. When you go to the Greek you will see the word epiteprobatakaya which it refers to by the sheep. But because of the adjective, there has to be a word to add in order to complete the sentence. Some version you will see the word gate. Some version you will see the word market. But it has came down as scholars dig deep within the background of the book of John. Seeing that there are clear references in the Bible. You can see references in Nehemiah 3 and verse 1. Nehemiah 3 and verse 32 and Nehemiah 12 verse 39 that give reference to a sheep gate and not a sheep market. So the correct translation as many seems it to be as sheep gate and not sheep market. But one thing caught my mind surprisingly also about this pool it says that it had five porches. What were these porches? The word Bethesda in house of mercy and it has it had five porches but before I deal with the porches we know that Christ is represented as a lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth and many believe that Christ entered this place through the sheep gate signifying that he was the lamb of God to be slaughtered for our sins he entered through the sheep gate and as the place is called Bethesda, this pool, house of mercy, these five porches are five places that provided a sense of cool and comfort for those who stop by the pool because the days were so hot that it will only add strain and misery to all those who gather at the poolside. And this context is not somehow as forming a pentagonal shape as many things. You see, archaeologists and various scholars didn't believe that there was a pool called Bethesda near the temple. But in the late 19th centuries, they discovered this pool. And they went to the book of John and realized that the place where the pool gave evidence of its location is the same place they found this pool. And they realized that it was not just one pool, but it was rather two pools divided into to two sections, a northern and southern pool, and the five porches divided, divided up this pool into two sections. Verse 3, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, of blind, alt, wither, waiting for the moving of the water. Why? For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whatsoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made all of whatsoever disease he had. Now I just laying the platform to build up to a point here. You see when you look at this passage of scripture we realize that there are many people gathered here. A wide variety of people. A large crowd 
crowd gather to seem to somehow find a way to heal the manner of sickness they were suffering from. They believed that certain season a particular angel would descend and trouble the water and whatsoever, the Bible didn't say whosoever, but whatsoever, a dog, rat, cat, or whatever it may be that entered the water would be healed. You see my friend, this is not specifically a true story. This is a form of a myth. They believe that an angel by the name of Raphael, whose name means God is my healer, descended some point, some time within this pool and whosoever enter the water first would be healed. Beloved, you got to know that myth has been coming from way back then. If you ever wonder where we, where we get the thing from, that when a person die, they are raised in three days. You need to check Christ's death and the resurrection. When you wonder where we Jamaican get the thing the nine night from, you got to go back to Egypt and realize when God delivered his people out of Egypt. So we, these things are nothing new. They have been coming from way back then. And you got to realize that this is not of God because God doesn't work first come, first serve. God is not a God that's going to look at his people suffering and pass them by and saying that I'm just going to leave you by chance that if you come to me first then you will be healed but I will forget about the others that are suffering. Verse 5, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Oh, this is a long time. Many of us suffer just for a day and we complain. Some even curse God. We suffer for a week and it comes in like we have been suffering for a decade. But this man having suffered for 30 years. That's a long time. As Jesus moved into the midst of this group. This group of suffering people. This group of people that didn't add much support to help them. We notice that he does not heal everyone at the pool that day. But he moved among the blind and he moved among the lame. He is drawn to one particular man who had been lying there for 38 years, a long time. But it's puzzling to me that, 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 that why out of all these very needy people, Jesus would choose to heal only one man. Was there suffering the longest? Maybe he was within the worst condition. Maybe there's something or some lesson that Jesus wanted us to know throughout the timeline of Earth's history. We don't know. John didn't give the reason why Jesus picked out this one man. But one thing we do know is that it was not because the man was asking for Jesus' help. He didn't even know who Jesus was. There's a lesson we need to learn from this. If we are tempted to think that God's healing depends on the quality or quantity of our faith, this passage offers a strong corrective. The man whom Jesus heals show no signs of faith or gratitude for what Jesus had done for him. And later on in the text, when he was confronted by the religious authorities about carrying his mat on the Sabbath, he deflects the blame to the man who healed him, whose name he has not even bothered to learn. John Gospel doesn't answer the question of why certain people are healed and others are not. But this passage makes it clear that healing is not a matter of having enough faith. That is not how Jesus operates. You see, you will read about in, in the book of, of James about the prayer of faith. You see, when I look at the story of Lazarus, it was not Lazarus' faith that allowed Lazarus to come back from the dead. When you look at the story of the ten lepers, you see many of those lepers, they didn't add much faith in Jesus. They didn't even show gratitude except one. So you look into this man's case 
and they look what John had portrayed. But this passage makes it clear that healing is not a matter of having enough faith. That is not how Jesus operates. Clearly Jesus does not heal for the benefit to himself in gratitude, praise, or devotion. He heals people simply because this is the work of his father as it tells us in verse 17. So this man who seem to be blind to the power and the presence of God in Jesus showed no faith nor gratitude towards Christ. It goes on to tell us in verse 6 as I'm building up to, 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 to a point that I want us to get clearly. When Jesus saw him lie and he knew that he had now been in this case a long time, Jesus said unto him, Will thou be made whole? Will thou be made whole? Jesus, the Bible let us know that he is our savior, a redeemer, a deliverer. Jesus does not only show sympathy, he shows empathy. For the Bible let us know that we have an high priest in heaven, one that has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be in pain. He knows what it's like to be in want. So Jesus could feel what this man and could relate what he was going through. But if you realize the man didn't say yes. The man didn't say no. But rather the man tried to find excuses. It reads, the impotent man answered him, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I am coming another step down before me, the past 38 years this man had been a beggar so he lived his life off the donation of others if he were to heal he would lose those donations he would lose the pity of others if he were to be healed he would then have to be responsible for himself he would have to find work just imagine yourself in a situation like this having work perhaps for no time of your existence and now if he was to be healed he would have to find job or find the means to sustain himself it would be a whole new world for him it would be equivalent today of offering this to a person who had lived on welfare if they were willing to give up that in order to get well. Now there would be risk. Now he would be responsible for himself as I said before. I see in this man many people like this in our, in our world today. Their lives are sick. Their lives are dysfunctional. But they have never considered that God might have something new for them. They don't know that there is something more to life. They hear the gospel. They even seem excited about it. But there comes a time when they realize they don't want to really be changed. And they leave. They reject the gospel of hope. The gospel of salvation. You and I must decide if we want to be changed. If we don't want to be changed, we must decide to stop making excuses. I want you to notice that, that the man avoids the question. He doesn't answer it. He doesn't say whether or not he wants to be well. He just complains. Tell us how unfortunate he is. Give us a long list of his troubles. You have some people 
the our world like this today, you ask them how is things, and they start to give you a large biography of all their problems. They have nothing good to say. Only thing they have to say is negative thing. But the fact that they are alive, the fact that they are breathing, is something to give God thanks for. They only look at the negative in life, but don't look on the positive. Their minds are so blind to the goodness of God that their eyes cannot see the blessings of God. It doesn't say whether or not he wants to be well. He just complains. In today's language, we would say that he sees himself as a victim. When a person always sees themselves as a victim of society, a victim of their upbringing, then they, they, are con then they convince themselves that everything that happens to them is because or the result of somebody else's fault. It has to be their wives, or husband, or their parents, or society's fault. Anybody but themselves. We can't help it but feel sorry for the man. All alone is family gone. He's lame. He's lonely. And he says, sir, I have no one to help me. In other words, I can't do anything for myself and God is not doing anything for me either. If we want to be changed, we must decide to stop making excuses. And I jump now to verse 8, where I like to pitch my tent, where I like to make three points. Verse 8, Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. I like to make three points. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. The first point is change your position. You see, this man was a beggar. He perhaps been in that position for years. You see, he said that there was no one to put him within the water, but there was someone that brought him there. You see, some people will help you thus far, but will leave you flat on your face to perish. You see, some people in life may just help you to the edge, but they won't help you to safety. But I'm troubled about something. This man was lame. But if he got in the water, how would he get back out if someone had already went in before him? Since they only believe that only one person would be healed the first. And he perhaps pitched his tent there for years, trying to be the first. But every time he got to the edge of the pool, someone else went in before him. You see, sometime in life, we're in our present position. But we, are, we do not realize that God wants us to change our position so that he can use us to bring forth a change. My other point is, change your profession. When Jesus says to the man, take up your mat, he was telling this man something. He's telling us something very important. If you truly want to be changed, then don't make any provision to go back. This man, he was a beggar. You see, beggars back then, they would fall out their mat and they would be there for days trying to find somehow to reach someone to get something in order so that they can be alive and well. Roll up your mat and take it in hand. Some of us, we need to change our profession. Sometimes we call ourselves Christian, but we are not professing what we truly should be professing. You see, inside the church, you know that, 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 that we call ourselves Adventists, but you have many types of vists. You have the dead Ventists that come to church that can't even say amen. They come to church, they are so dead, stone cold dead, that it seems like the power of God. 
has no power at all and they boast about being lukewarm but I say that a lukewarm Christian is not a Christian that God is, in, is proud of a lukewarm Christian don't really want to be saved from their sins they only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin but not the power of their sins then you have the sad Ventus. they're always sad that the goodness of God seems like a burden to them so they can't even rejoice even when the song says rejoice or pure in heart they can't even rejoice in church they sit with a frown and sad as if to worship God is a burden then you have the bad ventus they are so bad that sometimes they're the loudest in church but you should catch them in the week and they couldn't even profess truly that they or a Christian their characters doesn't show they play the game but don't bear the name all to the title but not the character then you add the watch Ventus they watch everything at church they watch the way you dress the way you walk the way you talk the way you eat the way you carry yourself it's like they are a watchman for God to see what the brethren are doing but you see we need to change our profession for God wants us to be Adventists. We should be living and a living representative of Jesus Christ. We should be living the life of Christ. As Paul says, for me to live is Christ. It is not me that liveth, but it's Christ that liveth in me. And my other point, as I'm coming down, change your direction. If you realize that when Jesus healed this man, he said, go and sin no more. This man who was stagnant in one location was now walking in a new direction. He was outside the temple, out among sinners, out there among people that was sick, people that was impotent, but Jesus healed him and pointed him to a new direction. Let me make an application of this text. Sin makes us beggars. Like this man, we want to live off the meager resources that are just temporary. Like this man, we may find it difficult to make ends meet each day. Like this man, sometimes we reject and neglect the grace and the goodness of God while rather feasting and sin that tastes so sweet but is bitter within the belly. Set your eyes on Christ and envision him in your life. Walk in the purpose that he had set before you. Make him the throne of your life and the chief commander. You may look back in 2018 and borrowing words from Psalms 118. You look 2019 in the eyes and you stare in the eyes of 2019 profoundly and you said you push me violently so that I was falling but the Lord helped me. Oh yes the Bible would have us to know that our God is a present help in times of trouble. He is a mighty deliverer. He is a strong tower. A mighty fortress is your God. A mighty bulwark that never fails. You may look at the point at the pains of yesterday. But I want you to know that you can have a bright future. For you have a God that gives bright tomorrows. For we serve a God that has a plan and a purpose for our lives. We serve a God that is greater than our problems. He is a God of new beginnings. Your hopes, your dreams and plans. God is the founder and the beginner of these things. And you can only find your true fulfillment in God. Remove him from the equation.
equation of your life and you will end up with a negative answer all you need to do is trust and obey for you can't come into 2020 with 2019 vision you can't come into 2020 with expired situation expired mood and expired problems you can't come into 2019 with expired stuff you see you have some people that brings 2018 problem into 2019 but they haven't read where by the scriptures say that today sufficient is the evil thereof give no thought for tomorrow you have enough evil already for today but give it to God and God will help you to all these problems no wonder why many of their futures behind them and their past before them what I'm saying many have their future behind them and their past before them many also trapped and focused in the past but all they see before them is their past while their future is behind them so as they walk forward they're only going backwards and not forward then there are some of us that, that, that try the same thing the same way over and over again even when we realize that it doesn't work someone says that that's insanity when you try the same thing over and over again yet ending up with the same result and refuse to try to change and to do things differently we must have vision we must have a godly mindset we have our minds too clouded at times and making no room for God we push him aside and all we can see is the negatives of life you need to change the way how you look at things in life and the things you look at will change Sometimes our minds are so fixed upon the negative that we can't see the positives. Our visions are clouded. Sometimes we are so focused upon the blessings of God that we forget the blesser. Sometimes our minds are so fixed on the creation that we forget about the creator. We have our minds clouded and we need to get it all cleared up. You need to change where or you see things. Have the vision like an eagle to see far and wide. Change your attitude and have that of Christ. You see the eagle doesn't waste time to fight with crows. He symbolizes to an attitude that crows cannot fly. Can I preach it like it is? You see you gotta rise above an attitude that crows cannot fly. Crows are scavengers. They will feed on your flesh. They will watch you die and try to be fat by what your life, by watching your life end up to become a mess. But you need to rise to an altitude that crows cannot fly. So when the crows snatch at you, when the crows try to block your vision and end your life, all you need to do is to change your attitude by ignoring the crows because fighting and arguing won't result anything if you act like a crow and talk like a crow then you mind just be a crow <laughs> so you need to have a vision you need to focus you need to redirect your thought redirect your purpose redirect your leading redirect your work in the hands of God so change your attitude and soar in the altitude of God an altitude that crows cannot fly an altitude where your purpose and goals are accomplished trust God I put all in his hands for God has turned a new page of your life and he has placed the pen in your hands to write your story but the question is asked what type of story 
will you write? When the past calls, let it go to voicemail, for it has nothing new to say. Do not be prisoners of your past, but look towards the future. Look towards God, for He is the ultimate reason why we're here, and only in Him you can find true purpose and true joy. And as I close, if we are not hungry for Christ, we are probably too full of ourselves. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. In verse 14, as I close, Jesus said to the man, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. John 5 verse 14. The sinner that Jesus was referring to is a sinner of unbelief. There are worse things than being reproached by religious authorities for breaking the Sabbath. If the man persists in his unbelief and indifference to Jesus, he risks incurring the judgment of God which matters far more than that of religious authorities. The man though made well seemed blind to the power and to the presence of God in Jesus and more concerned about his standing with man, his standing with earthly powers and not so much of his standing with God. Where is your standing? Where is your focus? Where is your next step? Where is your vision? Think on these things. Where is your life going? Where you want it to go? Do you open the doors of your heart to God so that he can take from your eyes that spiritual cataract so that you can see clearly? God has a spiritual eye source that we need so that we can see clearly. We need to have a clear vision. It's now 2020 and you can't have an 1820 vision. You can't have a 2017 vision. You need to have a 2020 vision so that you can see clearly and you must redirect your mind, your priority to God. So I ask you the question, where is your focus? Where is your life going? Look towards the future. Look towards God. For only He alone can give you the joy, the peace that you truly need. So, at this time, if you believe that God is a God, of love, then just stand as I pray. If you believe that God's a God of mercy and He can give you the vision that you need, then just stand for your seat. But if you believe that God hasn't done anything good for you, then remain seated. But if you know that God is a good God and He has done something for you, then just stand as I pray. We need to have a 2020 vision. Let us pray. Divine, mighty, holy, righteous, eternal God, as your words has just gone forth. Father, we pray now that your spirit may move upon our hearts to allow us to see clearly. May you enlighten our darkness, Father. Guide us not to walk in darkness, not to be children of darkness, but children of light. Guide us to walk within the footprints of Christ. Mark out within the sands of times. Let us put our hands in your hands. Let us put our life within your hands, Father, so that you can guide us throughout this year and throughout the days ahead. Be with us, God. Strengthen us and draw us into a deeper and intimate relationship with you. For this I am the pray and I'm the of you. In Jesus' name. Amen.